Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our program. I am Carrie McKinnon of the Goleta and San Inez Valley Libraries. Today's program is coming to you from the Solvang Library. And this program is part of the Goleta and San Inez Valley Library's third annual Book to Action program. This is a community reading program, which this year centers around the themes of diversity and inclusion, which are found in the stunning, stunning graphic novel memoir, They Called Us Enemy by George Takei. Shared in the format of a graphic memoir, They Called Us Enemy is George Takei's firsthand account of his childhood experiences as a Japanese American who was forced from his home into an internment camp during World War II. Now, his moving story of courage and the challenges faced by his family spotlight the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion for all, which remain at the forefront of global conversations today. We want to thank the California Center for the Book for organizing many such community reading programs at libraries throughout California. And we would also like to thank the Friends of the Library of Santa Inez Valley and the Friends of the Goleta Library for assisting with funding for the program. Now, today's very special speaker is the first of five planned over the next few months. She's a first person witness of the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. And she is a tireless advocate and educator today in speaking about this history. From age 10 to 13, June Aochi Yamashiro Burke was incarcerated with her family in the Rower Japanese American War Relocation Center in Arkansas. Between 1942 and 1945, more than 8,000 Japanese Americans were interned in this 500 acre camp, surrounded by armed guards and barbed wire. Also in that camp were George Takei and his family. Before retiring, June was the executive assistant to Irene Hirano Inouye, former CEO president of the Japanese American National Museum where she still volunteers today. She's the co-chair of the Minoru Yasui Civil Rights Committee in Los Angeles and the Santa Anita, Santa Anita Assembly Center Reunion Committee. She's also a board member of the Tuna Canyon Detention Station Coalition located in Tohunga, California, on which website stories of the men and women of Japanese, German, Italian, and Peruvian Japanese are preserved. Today, June will talk about her family's experience as one of the 120,000 Japanese Americans evicted from their homes and communities and forced without due process to live in American concentration camps for three and a half years. This evacuation was the culmination of the federal government's long history of racist and discriminatory treatment of Asian immigrants and their descendants that had begun with restrictive immigration policies in the late 1800s. Let's bring June on. Welcome, June. We're so happy to have you with us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. The first thing I wanted to chat with you about is language. Yes. The kind of language that we use to talk about what happened. And there's some terms that have been used in the past that maybe aren't the right terms today. And I wonder if you would talk to us about that. Um, how words like relocation and evacuation and camp are maybe not quite what we ought to be using. Yes, uh, those are euphemisms that were used when we were first evacuated. Uh, I wanna say, they said evacuated, but I <clears throat> correct that to we were evicted just as the Jewish families were evicted from their homes in Russia and Poland during the pogroms. We were evicted from our homes and sent to live in America's concentration camps, which is not to be compared with the German and the Nazi concentration camps of Europe. Those, we consider those as death camps. Uh, they were, they, they were sent there for their death. Now, the American concentration camps 
we were not sent there for our death, but we were still locked up behind barbed wires with soldiers with rifles in guard towers um, guarding us. And we also had curfew. We also had searchlights going over the camps at night. So in effect, we were just prisoners. And so I call ourselves inmates of these prison camps. An inmate sounds like we did something wrong, but we never did anything wrong. We never had our day in court. Uh, it was just a racial and systemic government prejudice act that sent us to these America's concentration camps. So I wanted to make those terms clear up front also. Thank you. Good, thank you. So June has shared some of her slides with us and we're gonna start, let's see. Make sure I can get them, here we go. All right. Yes, this first slide is a slide of the um, Chinese and Japanese railroad workers in the 1800s. My father came to this country in 1899 at the age of 20 to work on the Union Pacific Railroads. They were laying tracks from Montana, Idaho, and Washington. And he, uh, <clears throat> at first they had Chinese workers here and in 1823, the government said no more Chinese and they had this Chinese Exclusion Act. So they stopped bringing over Chinese. And so the railroads went into Japan to get Japanese workers to come to the United States to work. And so my father came and worked on the railroads from 1899 to about 1907. He ended up in Seattle, Washington. Um, he had many stories that he would tell um, about his experiences. And because he knew how to say yes and no and thank you, he was made a foreman and also the cook for the uh, railroad gangs. And he uh, would go to the grocery store to buy um, eggs and flour and things like that. And <clears throat> he often told us that he didn't know how to ask for eggs or flour or salt at the store. So he would flap his wings like this and the, the store owner would know, oh yes, do you want eggs? Um, and one day he said, he, he told us that story about, he was always saying to the men at the breakfast table, he was the cook and he would say at the breakfast table, shut up, shut up, shut up. And the men would get so angry with him. What are you saying to us? Shut up. He says, no, I want the syrup. He's trying to say syrup. He couldn't say syrup. So he kept saying, shut up, shut up, and almost got into fights. So he would tell us stories like that about his first experiences in coming into America. He said they had told him that the streets in America were paved with gold. And so he said, I'll make my first million dollars and I'll return to Japan, he told his family. But of course, he never went back to Japan because he never made a million dollars. So we, uh, this is a picture of my mother who came into, um, from, a, <clears throat> to America in 1920s. In 1924, they stopped the Japanese immigration from Japan. So she came just in time to marry my father. My father was first married in Tacoma in 1907. I have his marriage certificate from Tacoma, Washington, and his first wife had died in a flu epidemic and left him with a child. So when he went back to Japan, he had to find a woman who would be willing to be the mother of his child and brought her back. And so this is my mother, her name was Kay. And she, um, 
first came to San Francisco and then she came down to Los Angeles and they lived in Los Angeles uh, up until the time of our eviction from our uh, home. She is so beautiful. Wow, I love that outfit. <laughs> yes, I, I, I enjoyed it her picture too. She even had gloves on and I, um, I love this picture of her. Thank you. So um, as we were living in um, Los Angeles in a section called Hollywood, my father was a gardener and he didn't have a truck. So what they would do is walk up and down Sunset Boulevard and Hollywood Boulevard and ring doorbells in he would push his lawnmower up the street and up the sidewalk, and he would ring the doorbell and he'd say, um, I'll cut your lawn for 50 cents. And the man would say, yes, okay. So then he would cut the lawn, gather all the um, uh, <clears throat> dead leaves and stuff, and he would bundle it in a burlap bag. Then they would walk their lawnmowers back to the boarding house where he stayed, and then they would pick up a wheelbarrow and walk back to Hollywood Boulevard, Sunset Boulevard, to gather all the dead leaves and things, the grass that they had cut. So that's how he started as a gardener, um, probably back in the 1920s when he first uh, came down to Los Angeles. So we were living in Hollywood, and um, my father uh, even owned the pool hall at one time. And then he invested in the oil wells in Bakersfield and lost all his money. So he was in that uh, 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 era. And then the um, depression hit in 1932. So they were struggling and trying to get out of the depression and working as a gardener again. And um, my sister would take me to the movies on Sundays and we used to see Deanna Durbin movies and Sonia Henney movies. And one day as we were walking home from the theater, uh, my sister stopped and she said, what are all these signs on all the telephone posts? And so she stopped and to read it. And it says that all Japanese living in this area uh, will be moved and evicted from the area. And so she said, um, she said real loudly to me, and I'll never forget it. She said, I'm an American citizen. They can't do this to me. I just took civil rights in high school, and they can't do this to Americans. And so she was really upset about that. And she told my parents, you're from Japan, and you have to go to these concentration camps. But I'm an American, and I don't have to go. Um, my mother said, well, Who's gonna take care of you if you stay here by yourself? And who's gonna take care of us in camp if you don't go with, to camp with us? And who's gonna take care of your sister and who's gonna take care of your brother? So my sister was reluctant in, to go into camp, but she was really, really upset at the government for issuing this kind of order. She thought it was very wrong. Um, so in the meantime, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, they had arrested a lot of the community leaders, the Buddhist priests, the Shinto priests, and through presidential proclamations, 2525, 2526, and 2527, which you'll hear about later from Dr. Russell Endo and Sigrid Toy and Conrad Kaspari, who are speaking in the weeks following. Um, these aliens were rounded up and um, a Buddhist priest was arrested in our home and taken away by the FBI. So um, my parents were very scared and all the Japanese people in the neighborhood started burning all their pictures. All We, um, we had a huge bonfire in our backyard. And I remember seeing my sister break our Japanese dishes and any photographs of our Japanese family in Japan was torn up and, and, and thrown into this fire. And anything that was Japanese was just quickly uh, uh, destroyed so that we wouldn't be under suspicion of being a spy. 
My father turned in his special uh, shortwave radio to the police department. And um, we, uh, everybody, my mother kept me home from school for a week. And later on, she let us go to school. Um, but my brother at that time was a junior in high school at Belmont High School in Los Angeles. And he was getting ready to play varsity football. And my sister was one month away from graduating from Belmont High School at that time. And she had she could not graduate with her class uh, and had instead to go to camp. So they were very, very upset because all their plans for their future, they could not um, even try to even plan anything. So on May the 8th, um, 1942, our family boarded a bus to go to Santa Anita Racetrack. They, it, uh, the government was building all these concentration camps inland, and it took them about five months to build it. So in the meantime, they made us Japanese stay in racetracks. This horse stall is a picture of our unit, our, host, our horse stall in Santa Anita. The back part is where my mother, my father, and I slept, and the front part would be where my brother and my sister slept, and they had a window. The back part would be, I guess, where the horse slept, and um, we had one dim bulb, light bulb, but uh, there were several of these units in one horse barn. And at night, we all had to be in bed by nine o'clock. The lights would be turned off, and a man would come by with a flashlight and flash it in our faces at, in our bed to make sure that we were each one of us in our beds. And we would all say, all clear, all here. And my brother stayed out of the house or the, <laughs> the stall, the horse stall, all day long, every day. And he would refuse to come home until it was time to sleep because he said the place smells so bad. So he was out playing softball or basketball on the racetrack where um, the men had made um, softball playing areas and basketballs for the young people to play. Um, the leadership in um, these camps, right away, the young people decided they're going to self-govern themselves in these places. So they would draw up block managers or uh, area managers, and they would plan activities for the people in these camps. At Santa Anita, they had dances on every Friday night and a high school teacher from uh, Arcadia or someplace would bring some instruments and come into Santa Anita and they would have a jazz band play modern jazz music. And um, a lot of people learned how to do the jazz and the foxtrot at the Santa Anita grandstand. And I used to watch them and that's where I learned how to dance <laughs> and uh, jazz dance and things like that. Um, and they also had um, trucks with loudspeakers in the back of the trucks and they would go around the camps and gather people in the evenings. And we would all, uh, with song sheets, we would all be singing things like um, the Army Navy song, the Marine Corps song, um, all the football college songs like USC, uh, Notre Dame. I think I learned all those college songs in camp while we were learning, uh, while they were trying to keep us busy. In, um, in uh, the end of September, beginning of October, they started shipping people out on rail cars. And some people went to Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Some people were sent to Arizona, Poston, and Gila, where it was very hot. And some people were sent to um, Topaz, Utah, and another group was sent to Minidoka, Idaho. 
and some were sent to Amachi, Colorado, and our family was sent to Rohrer, Arkansas. There were two camps in Rohrer, both um, uh, Jerome, Arkansas and <coughs> Rohrer, Arkansas. That's a picture on the left of my, our family, my mother, my father, and me in front of our unit. And that little baby is a baby that my, mo my mother used to babysit for. Um, and she often babysat for little kids. So it, you, behind us, you'll see uh, the window to our unit. And you'll notice that there are these beautiful uh, morning glories and night glories. And my mother would also um, grow um, gourds uh, that she said the soil was so rich because all they grew in Arkansas at the place where we were located was um, cotton. So the soil was like virgin soil. So she said she can grow anything here and whatever she planted, it grew beautifully. And so she would have these beautiful flower gardens and we would, she would grow strawberries and green onions and whatever she put in the earth, it just grew. Uh, like that. And um, my father would teach um, kabuki, uh, shamisen, which is like a uh, guitar, and they play kabuki music. And he was a teacher of that. He taught that from the time he came from Japan in 1899, and he still taught that in camp. Um, to your right is a picture of me when I turned 13 years old. My sister had sent me a dress from Minnesota and um, uh, somebody, I don't know who, took a picture of me. And it kind of reminds me, in camp, in our room, our room was about nine by 12 or maybe 10 by 12. So all five beds were lined up next to each other. Uh, against the wall would be my brother's bed and then next to him would be my father's bed and then my mother's bed, and then me, and then my sister would be on the other end. And <clears throat> all we had in our room was one pop belly stove to keep us warm, one light bulb, and the five beds. And I asked my brother the other day, did we ever have a closet? And he says, no, he doesn't remember a closet. So we were trying to figure out, well, where do we keep our clothes? So he says, I think we hung it on nails inside our room. So um, if you did laundry and it was raining outside, you just hung your clothes inside your room. Um, somebody made a table for my mother and a stool for my mother, a small table. So she would sit inside her room and she would get old material and cut it into strips. And she would braid these strips and, <clears throat> and make it into braids. And then she would take these long strips of braids and glue it on the bottom of a um, uh, cardboard. And she would use leftover rice from the mess hall to come and um, uh, paste the uh, uh, braided rope onto the uh, cardboard. And she would make gifts of slippers for different people. And she also made beautiful jewelry boxes out of old kimono material and she would give those away as gifts also she also made me a kimono that i performed japanese dance in and she also made me the obi and she got her material from sears roebuck catalogs and she hand sewed it at night and she made all these things for me i wish i had kept them i still have the obi but i don't know what ever happened to my kimono so she they kept busy in doing those kinds of things. And we were, um, uh, we were able to, the people that were very handy with their hands, uh, they could grab scrap lumber and make furniture for themselves for their uh, unit. And some people made beautiful dressers and some people made beautiful even beds and chairs and tables for themselves. And my brother made a lawn chair for us. And I don't know why he ever made a lawn chair, but 
he, somebody taught him how to make a launcher. So we had a launcher in front of our house. And um, uh, people were had to be very creative, find whatever they can around the uh, camp. If there was a, a loose board or some extra shelving or some extra wood, they would create um, things for their um, yard. I have a son-in-law now who's quite a creative carpenter, um, loves to create furniture. I think he would have had a ball in camp <laughs> because that's what a lot of people did in their spare time is to build furniture for our rooms. But the camp that I remember was brown dirt, black barracks, and gray skies. That was the color of the camp. We had green trees because part of our camp was in forest area and we had a lot of trees and a lot of trees that fell during thunderstorms. The top picture you will see is our barrack to the left. That's where we slept and stayed. And then the building to your right you'll see is what they call the mess hall. And <clears throat> at seven in the morning and at 12 noon and also in the evening at 4.30, they would ring the dinner gong and everybody would line up outside and walk inside like cafeteria style, get their food. Each block had their own cook. And if you had a good cook, you were fortunate you had good food. Some cooks were better than others, but they were all given a certain supply every day. And this is what they had to cook for our meals. Um, and to your right, <clears throat> you'll see, um, my girlfriend and I, um, fathers would make toys for us, playground equipment for us. And uh, somebody made a seesaw and a teeter-totter for us. So my friend Angela Yamashita and I would play for hours on the seesaw. With Angela, my friend, her father was one of those who were taken away from his family and his children and was imprisoned, imprisoned at Tuna Canyon. So she was separated from her father. I didn't know this at the time. I only learned this after I started working for Tuna Canyon uh, Legacy Project. But I found out and, and uh, I thought how sad that during this time when I was playing with her, she was separated from her father. Um, the lower picture is a picture of one of our floods that was quite often um, in camp. We had a lot of floods, we had a lot of rain, we had a lot of mosquitoes, but we also had beautiful fireflies too, I remember. And um, the, um, because of, of all the trees, the um, men would go down and grab uh, roots of these trees or tree branches and they would bring it home and they would start these beautiful carvings and they would make it into a beautiful art piece. Um, and they would sometimes make gorgeous lions and different kinds of animals out of a tree stump and um, become, there was a man in our block who taught wood carving <clears throat> and made beautiful uh, wood carvings for um, people to enjoy in camp. And I don't know what, uh, I was doing, but at some point um, I was in a craft class. I think it was in junior high school, a craft club. And um, I learned, <laughs> I made a hanger. I don't know why I made a hanger, but I made a hanger. <laughs> that was about as far as I got in crafts. <laughs> and uh, some people were knitting and crocheting, sewing, making paper flowers because we had no flowers. And even in our stage performances, the parents made all the backdrops and the staging, the flowers for the stages. And if we had a funeral, um, people would make paper flowers for the funeral because we had no flowers. A uh, picture you see there to your left is my fifth grade class. And um, I'm the second from the top, um, <clears throat> second row from the top. 
And our, my teacher's name was Mrs. Brewster. And her son was also in my class. And she was a teacher that they hired somewhere from Arkansas or Louisiana or Oklahoma. And these teachers were very good. They were very kind to us and they were very strict. And I remember Mrs. Fox, my sixth grade teacher, who was really, really a good English teacher. And I learned um, so much about sentence structure, verbs, adverbs, sub subjects, things like that. And I, had to th I have to thank her for giving me a good background in English. So we did have good education. We had good teachers. And some of the teachers were <clears throat> inmates, Nisei, older Niseis, who were paid maybe like $16 a month. And the regular teachers got regular pay from the government. To your right is um, our dance group from Madame Fujima Kansuma, who was our teacher. And this is a picture I'm second from the left, um, we traveled to Jerome camp to perform there uh, with our umbrellas. And we, we performed in Rover and also in Jerome. Um, and a lot of these clothes were made by our mothers who would stay up and make these clothes for our costumes. And they would order the clothing material from, again, Sears Roebuck. Um, oh yes, the government also gave us a choice of dresses to wear to school. So in my classroom picture, you'll see several of the girls wearing the same dresses. And, and the boys and girls often had the same shoe on. And we would sit there and argue that they had on girl shoes and the boys would tell us we had uh, girl shoes. We would fight about that, but we, um, I am so uh, sad to think that so many of these people are no longer with us. And um, uh, I really treasure the friendship during our camp. We made wonderful friends in camp. And in junior high school, we had classes and even clubs. We had all the uh, uh, sports and and my girlfriend um had a baton and <clears throat> i had asked my mother to um buy me measurette boots to take to camp because i didn't want to wear the ugly brown boots so i had my majorette boots so we learned baton twirly in camp and at football games we were the majorettes and um, that was another activity that we did and Takayo Fisher <clears throat> was our baton twirling teacher at, in Rower, Arkansas. Um, that was it was that was the uh, things that we, we would do to keep ourselves busy, and uh, the, our parents encouraged us to um, do everything. We, they made us so that we would have a normal type of life in camp. But like um, George Takei, who was like four years old, maybe three or four years old, it was a much different experience for them. I remember a little boy saying, um, I want to go home now from Santa Anita. After a weekend, spending a weekend in the horse stall, he says, okay, I'm ready to go home. And the mother had to say, this is your home. And um, the boy cried because he wanted to sleep in his own bed. And uh, I think children that were like three, four years old, like George Takei, it was a very frightening time for them. They didn't understand what was going on. They would see their parents upset. Um, and for us who were a little bit older, we were 10, 11, 12, 13, um, we were able to uh, have our parents uh, give us everything that they wanted to give us to make us feel and have a normal childhood, baseball games, volleyball games, softball games. That's a picture of my 
a dance teacher, Fujima Kansuma, who to this day is still teaching. Uh, she came from Japan. I mean, she was born in Nisei, studied in Japan, and she came back to America. Uh, and I was her student from 1937 when I was five years old up until the time we had to go to camp. And then also in Rower, um, she was there to be a teacher and we continued to study our Japanese dance with her. She was also invited to go travel to other camps to dance and to entertain the older people. <clears throat> the director of our camp had been in Japan before and he enjoyed the arts and he felt that it was very, very important and valuable for the Issei's, the first generations, to keep their morale up by being entertained with our Japanese dance and kabuki. And um, you'll see in her costume here, she uses chopsticks to, for her hair ornaments. And she had beautiful clothing that I think she was able to go to uh, Los Angeles under security guard and pick up some of her valuable dresses and kimonos um, so that she could dance. And I heard that she danced in Amachi, Colorado, where they had to build a special outdoor stage for her because there were so many people who wanted to watch her dance. And then I heard also that there were men with tears streaming down their faces watching her dance because she was so beautiful and reminded them of their youth in Japan and all the things that were beautiful about Japan. So, and so this is my brother, <clears throat> my two brothers. Um, Yas, my brother was 16 years old in camp and uh, he worked for the commissary. So they had to go out of camp <clears throat> to buy ice for the camp. Um, but since they were from the uh, concentration camp, they were the last to be waited on. So while they were waiting for the ice, he would walk around town, they would go shopping, or they would take in a movie. And this is where we learn that, um, and my father too learned, he was given a special permit to go to Little Rock, Arkansas. And he was forced to sit with the white people. They tried to sit in the colored section or they tried to drink water from what they called the colored for colored only. And the buses were for colored only. And that's where they sat because that's where they thought they belong. And the bus driver would come and say, no, you have to sit with the white people. And my father was so upset. I remember he came back to camp saying, how can that be? We are enemy aliens. We are, they are fighting Japan in the war and we are being treated better than the poor people, the poor black people in the South. And he was, he, he just couldn't believe, it was just so incredulous to him that enemy aliens would be treated better. Um, my brother, uh, Yas, who was 16, and he bought this uh, hat in McGee, Arkansas, of a zoot suit hat, and he, made a pair of zoot suit pants made for him. And he was very popular in camp. And I would always recognize him in the dances that we had um, in the mess halls because I could see his hat moving around the dance floor. They would dance in the dark. Um, they would make it like it was a nightclub. And their drinks, their drinks would be, um, just plain old uh, fruit drinks and <clears throat> they would call it different kinds of, uh, of drinks but it was all just plain old uh, ice drinks that they had in camp so my brother on the right uh, was forced to go to um, post in arizona with his wife and child and then he decided he wanted to volunteer for the U.S. Army. So he joined the 442. He trained in 
Miss Camp Shelby, Mississippi, which was the next state over from our camp, but he could never come to visit my mother. He then left and he wrote my mother a letter. And um, I remember reading the letter to my mother. He wrote it in English and he asked me to translate it to her in Japanese. There was one light bulb and um, my mother was just sat there, she was sewing. She didn't look up as I read the letter to her and my brother apologized to him, her, and he said, I'm sorry, I have to do this. I have to go fight for our country because we want to prove our loyalty to America. And I don't want to be called Japs anymore. We, so he went to fight for a better life for us. And I still remember that letter. I wish I had kept it. I don't know what happened to it. But he was one of the lucky ones to come home. He fought in Italy and Germany. And I think he ended up in France where he was injured. And he was in a hospital in Paris. But he has a picture of Briere. And the Briere, the town of Briere was liberated by the Japanese soldiers, um, the 442, from the Nazis who had um, captured that town. And so the people in the town were so grateful for the 442 coming in to save them. And so every year in Briere, they celebrate the day of liberation and they thank the 442 for saving them. When the 442 came back from this, their time in um, Germany, um, there were only a few, not as, there were so many that were dead and injured in the battles. Um, and they had a parade. Truman saluted them at the White House lawn. And he said, you boys, fought the battle overseas against the Nazis and you won and you fought the battle of prejudice here at home and you won that too. So we, we were grateful to them because I forgot to say this, but our parents, the Japanese could never apply for citizenship. They were never allowed to become citizens or buy property. And finally, finally in 1953, because these soldiers performed so admirably and gave up and sacrificed so much, so many of them sacrificed their lives, that Congress finally approved the act where our, our parents could finally become American citizens. And it was on the day that the law passed that many, many of our first generation Japanese Isseis would go run down and get their papers at the city hall to become naturalized citizens. And since then, they were able to become American citizens. And so for that, we're really grateful for the men who served in the 442. Um, there were stories of men in Tuna Canyon who I've recorded. <clears throat> stories for the father. Father would tell their sons, I was born in Japan, so I'm here behind barbed wires. And I'm here in prison because I, I'm, I was born in Japan. He said to his sons, you, my son, you were born in America. So you go and fight for your country. And it's those kinds of words that made uh, one young man who graduated from high school uh, decided he wanted to volunteer for the army and joined the army and was one of the first ones to be killed in Europe. But because he wanted to prove his loyalty to the country, that's why he volunteered. And 
there was another case where in our block, <clears throat> we had blue stars hanging in our windows for people who had family members serving in the army. But you got a gold star if you had someone in your family who was killed overseas. We had one family cause Saito in our family, in our camp, in our block with two gold stars. Both of his brothers were killed in the battles in Europe. And um, one, of the, the one of the brothers wrote to his father, um, dad, don't think that your son ever died in vain. He died because he believed in our country, the USA. So never feel bad. He did not die in vain. He died because he wanted to be here. Soon after he wrote that letter to his father, um, Calvin Saito was killed. The youngest brother, Kaz Saito, wanted to volunteer. But since there were already two that were killed, the army refused to take the third son. But they lived right in our block. And so their stories are very, very close to my heart. But the, we, the, um, the, this, this is a picture of, I was sitting in the back of our truck and this is the last image that I saw <clears throat> leaving Roar, Arkansas. We were headed to Denver, Colorado. We, um, I was sad to leave because I'm sad to leave my friends. My sister had gone out of camp earlier because she was befriended by the American Quakers missionary who sponsored her to go to a beauty school in St. Paul, Minnesota. They paid for her housing and her schooling and she was able, there were so many young people who wanted to go to colleges and schools. And it was the American Quaker Service Committee that were the um, uh, instrumental in getting the young people out of camp by sponsoring them. Some people wanted to go to work in Chicago and the back East because there was less prejudice against them in the Midwest and East so they can go to colleges, they can find jobs uh, without being discriminated against. And so um, through the kindness of the American Service Committee, the Quaker organization, um, who also sent us children gifts in camp. I remember receiving a Christmas gift in camp and I thought, well, who is this from? And they said, well, there's friends, friends of, uh, outside. And later on, I found out it was the American Quakers who sent us these gifts to all the children in camp uh, for Christmas. So there were many, many acts of kindness that um, I wanted to share with you because even in these horrible times, the kindness of strangers was so touchy to me that is something that I'll never forget. Um, and I wanted to let people know about those strangers also. There was a man, <clears throat> um, a missionary who spent years in Japan. His name was Herbert Nicholson. And he befriended the men in Tuna Canyon by taking letters to them from their families and taking letters from the men and delivering it by hand to the families outside. Um, and he would bring things from their homes to them. And he tried whatever he could to help these men. And, and even Merle Scott, who was the director of the Tuna Canyon <clears throat> detention station, there's stories about him and his kindness. He, would even say, I could, I could let all these men go home for the weekend and I know they'll come back on Monday. He, 
he felt that kindly toward these prisoners. But of course, the government wouldn't allow him to do that. But because of his many kindnesses to the men who were inmates at Tuna Canyon, the men made a ceramic jar and now is in the museum, or well, if we do ever build the museum, it'll be there. But it was given to be in our archives at Tuna Canyon in appreciation for Merle Scott and his kindness that he showed the men in Tuna Canyon. And there are so many stories of people who came home. And there's a lot of stories of the devastation that people found when they came home after the war, after three and a half years, uh, when we were allowed to go back to the West Coast. There were so many stories of <clears throat> people with all their damaged uh, goods when they found they came home. But there were also so many good stories of neighbors taking care of their neighbor's farm or their neighbor's houses, even to the point where one family came home and their house was stocked with fresh groceries as if they had never left. And these stories of the kindness of strangers, I think need to be told more often because there were so many people. There was a black family that lived in our neighborhood. <clears throat> and before families had to go to camp, before we had to, the morning that they had to leave to go to Santa Anita or Pomona, uh, this family would make a big, big breakfast for everybody and make coffee for them to take in the thermoses um, and send them off. And as they were going to these uh, assembly centers, they were there to send them off. They were even there to come visit them sometimes inside where we were. So there were so many, so many people who did show us kindness, even through the systemic racism and prejudice that was prevalent in those days. So this is the this quote is from a haiku poet that says, little did I value freedom when I was free. But once you are penned up, you learn what it means and how priceless is liberty. And that is so true. We don't value our freedom until we are locked up. Um, I want to tell you another story that um, warms my heart when I think of camp is when um, I, I think I've talked too long now. <laughs> no, no, keep going. We want to hear this story. <laughs> um, later on in camp, we got to know the guards and we would wave to the guards, pull the barbed wires apart and we would sneak out of camp and we would run down the gravel road to the swamps, play in the swamps and we would go to the town of Rower. And my friend remembers buying a soda from the, the, the store, the man at the store was so poor, he didn't even have wooden floors, he only had a dirt floor. And he had an ice chest. And she, she was able to buy a bottle of soda. Well, I asked for ice cream. And the man said, we don't sell ice cream here. And I thought, well, I could get ice cream in camp. So then we would walk all the way back, about six or seven of us kids, um, <clears throat> where I think we were seventh graders or sixth graders. And then we would pull apart the barbed wire again and we would wave to the guard and he would wave back to us and we'd go back into camp. <laughs> and I don't think I, even our parents knew we were, we were gone. <laughs> so we, we, um, later on the, the uh, guards would be more relaxed and we, be friendly with us. I love that story. I just love it. Wow. Well, we have a little time left. I did want to ask you a question, and I think I have a slide or two that you've given us. I want to ask you about after you got out. You, Your parents were so careful and lovely with you to try to give you a, a childhood in this difficult, difficult situation, but it's clear that 
your knowledge of what happened and your activism about it grew. So I wanted to ask you how that happened. Yes, uh, I worked, um, as soon as I got out of high school, I worked for Min Yasui. Min Yasui's case was up before the Supreme Court. He was arrested for breaking curfew. And his case was, you cannot put curfews on American citizens for no reason. Um, he lost his case at the Supreme Court and he was put in solitary confinement uh, for 16 months in a j small jail cell in Multnomah County near Portland, Oregon. He was my boss and through him, he gave me the courage to speak out. He was one of our foremost activists. He was our Martin Luther King uh, with his oratory skills and his passion for justice. His passion for justice was not for only Japanese Americans, but for the Indi indigenous Americans, Indian Americans, for the Mexican Americans, for black Americans. So they honor him in Colorado with a day of remembrance and they honor him in Oregon where he was born for his activism and his fight for justice. He never gave up the film that he, about his life that his daughter made, Holly Yasui made about him, was called Never Give Up. And he was awarded posthumously the Presidential Medal of Honor by President Obama a few years ago. And uh, I worked for him. He was uh, totally, totally engrossed in civil rights and justice for all. And I have to thank him for giving me the courage to speak out. Wow. I learned so much from him. And um, there is so much on that website that you shared with me, the Minoru Yasui Legacy.org. Yes. So, so much on there. This is fantastic. Um, you know, I failed to, at the top of this presentation, invite the audience, but you still can, um, to use the comment um, uh, section in either Facebook or YouTube to submit questions if you have them. And let's see. While we're waiting to see if anyone wants to do that, June, I did have one last question for you. And Lately, we've been hearing about terrible incidents of hate crimes against Asian Americans. And I wanted to ask you if you have any just specific thoughts for us about how can we stand against the proliferation of these ideas and actions? And do you have any message for us on this subject? Yes, I think we can no longer stay quiet. I think we have to speak up when we see something wrong or hear about someone being um, a victim of a hate crime because you know in uh, Richard Rogers and Rogers Hammerstein play of um, South Pacific there's one line that stands out it says hate has got to be taught you have to be carefully taught by the time you're six seven or eight hate has got to be carefully taught so I think this hate that we are hearing about now was taught to them. People are not born with hate. People are not born that way. And they only are taught that. So we have to make sure that we teach our children not, not to make fun, not to bully, not to uh, uh, pick on somebody because they are different or they have different characteristics or different um, lifestyles even because it, we need to respect one another and uh, for all of us to get along. Um, we just can't afford to hate. Wow. That is lovely. And it's so true. So I don't know if maybe our comment function isn't working because I'm not seeing any coming in. So I don't know what's happening with that. I sort of can't believe that all you people that are watching don't have a question, but I apologize if we're having a technical difficulty. It's okay. I probably um, 
on. <laughs> I do know you didn't. June gave us one last screen to share, and it is so beautiful that I want to put it up now. And this is June's amazing family. This in photo, the twenty-first. This photo was taken by uh, Shibuto Charabahi, and um, several years ago, the youngest little girl you see here now is graduating from high school uh, next month. And so I'm so grateful for my husband, uh, Marty Burke, and I'm so grateful for each of my children, um, starting with Susan and Dave uh, Milner and my daughter uh, Jill and her children, Miles and Madison. I forgot to mention my grandchildren, Corey and Taylor, Riley, um, and the two from Sacramento, my son, Kyle, and his wife. Um, there's Wayne and Lee that live in Glendale, and their daughter, Alex, and the ones that are in Sacramento is Troy and Lily, who uh, are now bound for the University of Alabama. So we, um, <clears throat> through, I, I guess I like to say that the phoenix rises out of the ashes of despair and now we have a future to look forward to just as the holocaust victims now the descendants of the holocaust victims total over oh, maybe a million by now um, and everybody is recovering from the trauma that they had and families are growing so i like to feel that as a phoenix rises, this is our <clears throat> tribute to the future. This is our hope. This is our dreams come true. And even in the worst of times, there are good things to come out of it. So I wanted to end on that note. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, June. And we did get one comment, so I'm going to post that up from somebody watching. So June, thank you so very, very much. And um, we're excited to have your teaching. Thank you. And um, I hope people will listen for uh, Russ Endel, who will talk more about the proclamations that sent people to um, arrest uh, German, Italian, and Japanese. Uh, aliens during World War II, and Ka Conrad Kaspari will be joining you from England, and he has a very interesting story about his father being arrested, and Sigrid Toy, who lives there in Santa Barbara. She will be talking about her father's arrest also, and being separated from her father when she was only five years old. So I hope your Thank audience you. will tune in on those stories too. Lots more good stuff to come. Thank you again, June. Thank you. Thank you Have so a much. lovely afternoon. Thanks Thank to everyone who joined us. Bye. Bye-bye.